This is another I Roar podcast. Hi, welcome to Storytelling Animals, a green new podcast of climate, ecology, and animal justice. Um, as you heard in the intro, we are a member of the I Roar network of pro animal podcasts. And for the first episode of the new year, we will be exploring what it means to be pro animal. For today's episode, I am speaking with philosopher Martha C. Nussbaum about her new book, Justice for Animals, Our Collective Responsibility. Nussbaum is the author of a couple dozen books about philosophy and justice and all that. Um, and she's written about animals before, but this is her first book entirely about non-human animals. Um, and it's really good. There are, I think, you know, specific elements of it that one can agree or disagree with. Um, I have my quibbles, but what's exciting about the book is one, that she's often sort of aware of the potential counterarguments, um, but two is that her broader framework is extremely useful. She has a framework for how we should approach justice for other animals, whether they are uh, domestic animals, wild animals, um, companion animals like dogs and cats. Um, and she approaches this, you know, not just as a, a personal moral issue, but um, a political and legal one follows in the tradition of books like um, Zoopolis, A Political Theory of Animal Rights by Will Kimlicka and Sue Donaldson. That book comes up a couple times in the interview. Um, in laying out a vision of what our laws and political and legal institutions uh, could look like, how they would need to change to adequately take other animals' interests into account. This is something that I think is a really exciting realm of, of thought. Um, it's something that has come up a couple times here and there in the show, um, but we maybe spend more time on it here than ever before. I should add before we start that her theory of justice for other animals relies a lot on the specific capabilities and needs and you know modes of consciousness of other species, um, and that is a subject we are going to dive deep into in our next book club, which is January 17th, to discuss Ed Young's An Immense World, How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us. That's going to be January 17th at 5.30 Pacific, 8.30 Eastern. Um, if you've read the book already, or if you think you'll have time to at least read part of it, or read about it, or listen to an interview with Ed um, beforehand, please consider joining us. Um, you can get a free trial uh, meeting of the book club by either signing up for my free newsletter or just reaching out to me, um, sending me a Twitter message or email. And you can join the book club on a more permanent basis by subscri uh, subscribing to this podcast on Patreon. A small monthly donation um, will get you various perks depending on the level of that donation, and it'll keep this podcast going. Our next book club is going to be February 28th uh, to discuss Appleseed by Matt Bell. This is an ecofiction novel that I've discussed previously on the podcast. I interviewed Matt a few months back. Um, and yes, this is episode 38 of this podcast. Um, come episode 40, that will mark about one year of storytelling animals. And I'm going to call that the first season, take a month or two break um, to prepare a new batch of episodes for you. But I hope you've been enjoying. I hope um, if you like this episode that you go listen to others, that you share them with friends or family, like, subscribe, leave a review. That would be really fun. Um, and sign up for the newsletter to keep up with uh, season two. And most helpful of all, of course, would be if you make that small monthly donation at patreon.com slash storytelling pod. But of course, no obligation to do any of that. Either way, I appreciate you listening and hope you enjoy Martha C. Nussbaum. Martha Nussbaum, author of Justice for Animals, Our Collective Responsibility. Um, Martha, thanks so much for coming on the show. Well, Dayton, thank you so much for having me on this show. It seems like a really interesting podcast, so I'm honored to be on it. Yeah, I, I hope it is, and it was a really interesting book. So um, it's, from what I counted on the, you know, the opening pages of the book, it's like your 24th book or something, and, and most of them have not been about other animals primarily. Um, right. you're... This is an interest that developed rather later in my life due to the influence of my daughter, who was a lawyer for animal rights. And we wrote a bunch of articles together 
And I started on this book, and which uses earlier a theory that I've developed earlier in my career. And so it's not entirely new, but it is new in its application to animal issues. And so then when my daughter died in a very untimely way at the age of 47, I really poured everything into this book. And I really wanted it to be as cogent and as influential as possible. And, um, you know, it's my way of keeping her commitments alive. Yeah, I, uh, you mentioned the capabilities approach as something you had developed previously and that you apply to other animals here. Um, you know, maybe some of our listeners have heard of that, but I'm sure many have not. Um, what is kind of the, the, it's a very complex idea, but what are some of the central ideas behind okay. that? Okay, so it was developed jointly by me and Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen, but he developed in it in a rather different way from, from mine. Basically, it started out in the area of development economics, where countries were being ranked against one another along the parameter of gross domestic product per capita. And that we felt was bad for several reasons. First of all, it's an average, so it gave very high marks to nations that contained huge inequalities. It didn't pay attention to the how people at the lowest end of society were doing. So the top developing country in the old days was South Africa under apartheid because there was a lot of stuff there and it didn't really matter how the people at the bottom were doing. And indeed, the fact that 90% of that country's people were totally unable to enjoy the fruits of the nation's wealth. So that was what we wanted to avoid. We wanted to ask how each and every person is really doing. But then the second problem is they have to be doing a lot of different things. People want good education. They want health. They want long lives. They want political powers and opportunities. And so, in short, you can't get it by a single number. So we introduced the capabilities approach in answer to the very obvious question, how are people actually doing? What are they actually able to do and to be? And the answer to that question is the set of capabilities people have. So capabilities are not internal skills. They are spaces in which people can choose to pursue activities that they value. So by now that has been pretty influential. The UN Development Program uses it to rank nations. And of course it's a complicated ranking because you have to include a lot of different things. But meanwhile, I developed it into an account of basic minimal justice, arguing that a country is only even minimally just if it brings all its citizens up above a reasonable threshold on a list of 10 central capabilities. And they include life, health, bodily integrity, but each of these is specified in a more concrete way. The use of senses, imagination and thought, practical reason, affiliation, connection to other species and the world of nature, play and leisure, and control over your material and social environment. So those are the large general rubrics, but of course each one is specified more concretely on the list. And so basically my idea was that this is a very good way of thinking about what we should be doing for animals. We should make room, make spaces for them to live their characteristic lives, pursuing activities that they value in all these areas of life. It's better, I think, than utilitarianism because it doesn't focus narrowly on pain, but instead looks at the many different ways in which animal lives are wronged and squashed in our world. An animal could be free from pain, but still missing the society of other animals of its kind. And I think a lot of zoos don't actually inflict pain. Some do, of course, but the problem is that they never, almost never give animals a large enough group of, a, of other animals of its kind. So that was the idea, to get all of the things that matter most in an animal life on the table and to say, that what is the goal is to promote good lives for animals along all these parameters using a list that would be peculiar to each species. So of course those lists don't exist yet, but I think all of them would overlap in some ways because of course all animals need longer lives, they need health, they need bodily integrity. And although their senses are different and their thought capacities are different in lots of ways, they need to be able to use their senses and their thought capacities and their imaginations. 
And then affiliation. Well, of course, the kind of affiliation that a parrot needs is totally different from the kind that an elephant needs or a dolphin needs. But we put that on the list in its species specific form. And the idea would be that a, a world really is only minimally just if animals get to be able to do all those things. So that's the basic idea. And I think it goes beyond utilitarianism. And it also goes beyond another approach that's very common in law, which is Stephen Wise's approach in his non-human rights project, where he ranks animals according to their likeness to humans. And then he says, well, there are a few that are enough like humans that they get special privileges and they get to be persons in law, elephants, apes, and maybe whales. So I think that's a very bad thing too. It's, it's, it's not a single measure like utilitarianism, but what's bad with it is that it treats animals as good because of their likeness to us. Animals should be valued and respected for their own dignity as the kind of animal they are. And so, you know, Wise leaves most animals out in the cold. He has nothing to say about the factory farming industry and other hor hor horrible harms that are inflicted on many, many animals. And why should he care about only the ones that are so-called like us? Now, I think his answer is that that's where judges are and he wants to sway judges. But I actually think you should persuade judges using the truth. And the scientific truth is that there isn't a vertical ranking of species in nature. Each species has its own unique capacities suited to its environmental niche. Some animals can do lots of things that we can't do. So anyway, that's my brief post to Stephen Wise. That was, a, I think, a very helpful overview. And yeah, like you said, it's so important that it's not saying here are the capabilities that humans have that you worked out originally and saying, oh, you know, chimpanzees have most of those, but not all, and chickens have some of those, but not all. It's it's looking at each animal differently. Yeah, um, exactly. And I do think it turns out that at the very highest level of generality, there is overlap with humans because we're all animals and we're all creatures who have to live in a rather hostile world. And therefore we need certain things. And we have a lot in common in that respect. We need love and affiliation. We need time for leisure and play. And so, but each species does that in its own way. And each species is different and has evolved to be suited to the niche that it occupies. Out of curiosity, how, uh, how have your old colleagues from the worlds of international development and human rights um, responded when you've told them how you're taking the capabilities approach and putting it in a non-human context? Well, yeah, I mean, we have an association called the Human Development and Capability Association. Now, you can see from that title what they think, namely that human development is what they're all about. And I've tried to change the title, but no one wants to change it. We have a little group within the association that for years now we've been working along animal lives and, and, and had panels and journal issues and so on about animals. And so there are basically, in addition to me, <clears throat> there were four other people. My daughter was one of them because although she was a lawyer, her boss let her go and give papers at this association. And we would co-author things where she would supply the law and I would supply the philosophy. But yes, these, these other people report to me. Of course, I'm, they, they're scared of me, so they wouldn't tell me that they think I'm doing something terrible. But they, the other people on, in our little group told me that, yeah, these people think you've deserted poor people. You've left them behind. So they're rather shocked. But, you know, I think that's changing now. The world is changing. Even Amartya Sen, who originally didn't care at all for this line of thought, he's become much more sympathetic to the plight of animals. And I think in general, in our world, there is a revolution in consciousness that we're part of. And so I, I find the, the reaction of shock and horror was at its height maybe eight years ago, but it's less now. And I just hope that those people understand that, number one, part of developing their own humanity is to be decent to animals and respect animals. But number two, it's not a zero sum game. If we do some things for animals, it usually makes human life better. What is it that migratory birds are dying from? Air pollution. 
And it turns out that actually the Clean Air Act has improved the lives of migratory birds as well as humans. What is it that whales are dying of? Well, plastic trash, which of course is a terrible problem in our whole environment. And so if we can get rid of plastic trash, well, we have to clean up what's out there because it doesn't, doesn't destroy. So the plastic that's in the, a bottle today will stay in the ocean forever and ever. But we have to clean that up. And then we have to not put new, new trash out there. And that's important for our human world too. So most of the things are not zero sum. And where there are, I mean, like competition of, let's say, villagers in Africa with elephants for the use of trees for bark. And so the elephants need them for bark and the villagers need them for, to be trees, to be healthy trees. Those are difficult conflicts. And I think we have to talk about those. And I have a whole chapter in my book about mediating these difficult conflicts between one species and another. So what I say about that one, there are actually whole NGOs that are working on this conflict mediation. The one big part of it is for humans to control human population, because it's not like the elephants have too many elephants. They're endangered. So humans have to not encroach more and more upon the land that's used by the elephants. So anyway, there are some cases where there's a conflict, but in most cases, actually, what's good for the animal world is good for us too. The meat that's produced in factory farms is very bad for human health. Meat in general is not good for human health. So if we got rid of the factory farms, even if we were left with some humanely grown meat, I think that would be a lot better for human health and so forth. So, so I just don't want people to see it as a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. So um, another aspect of the capabilities approach for animals that I want to highlight um, is that it's, it's not relying necessarily, at least as I read it as, you know, reliant on all of us sort of sharing the same sort of intuitive bedrock ethical notions um, like someone could be a utilitarian or a Kantian deontologist or whatever else, but you design it to function, to be somewhat ecumenical. To, um, and I think part of that is that it's not solely sort of an ethical theory, but also meant to be a political and legal approach to justice. Right. And, and therefore, it can't include metaphysical ideas that are controversial between groups. I follow John Rawls in his wonderful second book, Political Liberalism, which says that when people differ greatly by religion and by comprehensive ethical views, the political view has to be narrower than that. And it has to try to be abstemious and not to include, let's say, a notion like the immortal soul. That would be too controversial. So we must frame it in a thinner way that everyone can sign on to. So it is indeed my hope that utilitarians ultimately can sign on to this, forming what I call an overlapping consensus, again, following roles. But right now, it is also issuing criticisms of utilitarianism as it currently is. And I think there are signs, as I say at the end of the book, that these other views are able to sign on. The, some of the people who initially followed a kind of so like us approach, like Stephen Wise, Stephen Wise is actually very enthusiastic about some of the capabilities, ideas, and some of the other people that I mentioned in that chapter also are. So we'll wait and see. But I, I do feel that I've framed it in such a way that people can jump aboard when they feel ready. So um, before we get into kind of like the, what does this all actually mean? Um, one of the interesting parts of the book was toward the beginning, and you just kind of get into this, there's a long history of ideas that we should treat other animals better, going back to early Greek and Indian thinkers. Um, can you talk about any, I don't know, surprises or particular insights you found looking at this lineage? Well, I myself am a scholar of ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. That's where I started my career. And I wrote my doctoral dissertation on a little work by Aristotle called On the Motion of Animals. And that in that work, so it's not a surprise to me since I did my doctoral dissertation in 1975, but what Aristotle says there is we need a, a shared framework for thinking about how all animals, including humans, move in the world using perception of various types, 
thought of various types and the desires of various types. And that all animals have this in common, that they see the things they need and then they move toward them and drawn by their own needs and their own desires. So any, anyway, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on that because it was really interesting to think we've lost this idea to a large extent that there is a common framework for humans and for animals. We set ourselves up on a pedestal that an Aristotle didn't see that there was such a pedestal. There was instead a common explanation. And then I think later than Aristotle, there are even more committed friends of animals. The late Platonists, particularly Porphyry, are really emphatic. Porphyry's On Abstaining from Animal Flesh is an eight book work of great detail and wonderful arguments that I encourage everyone to read. I think it's probably the best book on vegetarianism written until the very recent times, and it's still worth reading. And then there are also people in India, I'm not an expert in Indian philosophy, but I've gotten to know something about Indian Buddhism through my interest, my political interest in India as a developing country where I've spent a lot of time. And in Indian Buddhism, of course, and in Buddhism in general, there's an idea of the kinship of all life. And the Indian emperor Ashoka, who ruled in the second to third centuries BC, decided to convert from Hinduism to Buddhism. And he wrote in his journals, which some of which survived, that he really had a new attitude to, to animals as a result. That he had learned to stop eating animal flesh. He said he hadn't achieved it totally, but he, he was working on it and he was getting there. And he had learned to, to show respect for all animal life. I think India you know, has a very strong tradition in both Hinduism and Buddhism, actually, of respect for animals. And that's why an Indian court recently said that animals are persons within the meaning of Article 21 of the Indian Constitution, which says all persons must not be deprived of life or liberty without due process of law. So that is a country that really has a long tradition. The ancient Greek and Roman tradition kind of got lost. I think it's because Christianity and Judaism took over and they, although I do believe, and I am a Jew, that Judaism can be interpreted so as to be much more respectful to animals than it typically is. I do think that for a long time, it wasn't understood that way and Christianity either. So, you know, notice that when the Pope said that he thought dogs were in heaven, all, all kinds of shock burst out and people thought he had said something terrible. So I think, you know, those traditions took over and they eclipsed the promising views that were in Greek and Roman antiquity. But India, I, I haven't mentioned China and Africa just simply because I know too little. I have never studied the, those traditions. Yeah, I uh, the eating of animal flesh is something that came up a couple times. Um, you know, in, in the real world, it feels like you don't actually need to have even that sophisticated a view of, of animal ethics um, to be at least skeptical of eating most animals raised in, in the real world because they are treated so poorly in life. Right. Um, um, but, you know, it, you also raise the question of you, if you treat an animal well in life, is there still a moral issue in, in killing them? And, and it leads you to wonder, is there an issue killing humans um, in such a situation? And, and what is that issue? So why is this, you know, maybe that sounds like, obviously, yes, a lot of people would think. So why is this a tougher question? Well, I think we first have to ask, what, when is death harmful to a creature? Now, here's another thing where I get a lot of help from ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, because the Epicureans had a fascinating discussion with the other philosophers, because they said death is not a harm simply because when somebody's dead, there's no person there anymore who can suffer loss. So it's just an end. It's not a time when you moan and groan over the pleasures that you're missing. And they thought that if the death was painless itself, that you're not being deprived of anything. Now, I think that's much too simple. So then I already in, in earlier books writing about Epicurus, I advanced an argument called the interruption argument saying that as long, long as a person has valuable projects underway, 
and is pursuing them through time. Death is a harm because it cuts off and frustrates those projects. Therefore, it kind of sheds a negative backward light on the life. The life is full of incomplete and frustrated things. So that was my argument. And of course, that applies to animals too, that if they're creatures who have projects extending over time, and I think that's true of most animals. I've read a lot of science for this book. Probably not true of fish. And I myself do eat fish with that idea in mind, that if a fish has a decent amount of life, reaches adulthood and has a good quality of life, and then is killed genuinely painlessly, not by line fishing, but let's say being conked in the head with a mallet, as some humane fisheries do, then I think up till now that it's okay to eat that fish. But I have many questions and many doubts, which I record in the book. Because of course, we don't think that just because a human being has reached the end of their projects, it's okay to kill that human being. I, I think that's actually dubious. If there is a human being who's really at the end of their projects, I think that would have to be somebody in the state of advanced dementia who's not really doing anything at all anymore, physician-assisted suicide is just fine. So we could argue about that. But in any case, uh, I follow that line, making a distinction between animals whose projects extend over time, they're on their way to doing something, and then they're blocked with other animals, and I think fish are like this, whose lives unfold in the moment. And therefore, they don't really have projects, and therefore they're not deprived of the fulfillment of a project. By by death. Yeah, I you know my my instinct is to say maybe it depends on the fish or maybe that it uh. Well, I'm just following current scientific research, and I say again and again, I may be wrong. We may find out mm -hmm. something else, you know, and and so uh, the the criterion for me is clear, but the application is not so clear because we're learning new things all the time. Right, and I think there are a number of places where that comes up in the book, um, and. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I'm someone who hasn't had fish in more than 10 years. Um, but what I what I think is interesting about your case, if you have a little personal info in the book, and uh, I hope you don't mind sharing that the you have issues uh, digesting um, beans and lentils, and so you have trouble getting protein. Yeah. And I think what makes this interesting is where there's actually more of a potential conflict between giving up fish and and living your own life flourishing. And also, don't forget, I, I expose the dairy industry and I say, you know, if you think that eating dairy is better than eating fish, you better think again, because actually, I think right now, according to what we know now, eating fish is more genuinely humane. The dairy industry, it's hard to imagine it being reformed in the way that the egg laying, in, so eggs might turn out to be okay. And I agree with Will Kimlicka and Sue Donaldson that we can imagine, and in fact, we already have parts of a ethically sound egg industry where the chickens are not really deprived. They have plenty of other eggs to lay. And there are enough eggs that can be sold to make a profit for the people who are in the business. Now, dairy, however, if you take the calf from its mother, that's the essence of what the dairy industry is. It's hard to imagine how you would perform that without that terrible experience of deprivation for both the calf and the mother. So they can't imagine a reformed dairy industry that would actually have a chance of making a profit, and I have a hard time too. So that's the problem, that we can reform some things, but other things, if we reform them enough, they wouldn't make a profit, so no one would do it. So anyway, that's why I'm left with fish. Yeah, I think eggs are interesting too um, because one of the one of the things that I've read about and heard from people who run sanctuaries is that the because chickens have been bred to lay 300 eggs or a, a year where it used to be a dozen or two or something um, that there are a lot of associated health problems with this and I I think this it makes me think about um, issues that there are with dogs where we're kind of in the situation where in the past there was breeding that was, um, I think, I think we can agree much of it was immorally done and 
no care for the health of the animal. Um, and now we're in a situation where we have actual dogs, though, who are around. And, um, you know, it's not necessarily saying that the breeding in the past was bad doesn't necessarily tell us what to do, how to behave with dogs, how to relate to dogs moving forward. Well, I don't um, agree that the very creation of dogs is so terribly bad. We don't know how. I'm thinking you know. more of, I'm thinking more of like breeding bulldogs to okay. be. Now that, I mean, they're two separate questions. Mm -hmm. Should there be dogs at all? And there are people who think we should immediately put an end to dogs by not allowing them to breed. And Carrie Francioni, for example, holds that view simply because dogs are have evolved so as to be asymmetrically dependent on humans. But to that, I say there's nothing wrong with being dependent. And the dog can have a very good life of dependency if human treatment is respectful and good. But what I do object to is this specific breeding that causes all kinds of health problems for the dogs. Bulldogs are an obvious case. They have skin problems, ear problems, and respiratory problems. But actually, things dogs that look so healthy, like the most popular breed in the U.S. is the Labrador Retriever, 24 known genetic diseases in that species, in that breed. And that's simply because of inbreeding. Inbreeding is always quite bad. So, yeah, I, I'm not surprised to hear that it's a very interesting point that that can happen to eggs as well. Yeah, and so on the subject of, of dogs and other companion animals, uh, I think you, you have some interesting ideas uh, about what a new paradigm for living with them could look like um, that is actually rooted in justice. Um, so, yeah, I'm wondering if you have, um, if you want to share uh, aspects of sort of citizenship for dogs and cats. I think, well, first of all, I'll say that Will Kimlicka and Sue Donaldson's book Zoopolis is a book I admire greatly and I agree with most of the things in it. Basically, what respectful companionship requires is genuine respect for the animal's capabilities, that is, for the things that are characteristic of the form of life. And, and of course, in, in the case of dogs, we have to talk about the breed and the size of the dog and so forth. And that means that you should only adopt a dog. And I think for now, adoption should be the primary means of acquisition because the industry of dog breeding is so corrupt there's so many puppy mills out there. So my own city has made it impossible to acquire a dog legally in Chicago unless you adopt it from through a recognized animal shelter. So if you have a shelter dog, then you have to think, how big is that dog? What does it want to do? What does it need? And you have to be prepared to provide enough exercise. I think probably 90% of dogs don't get enough exercise, certainly in the city. And you have to think, how much attention and love does it need? Dogs, rather unlike cats, need a great deal of human presence and affection and love. So I actually don't have a dog because I think I travel too much and I wouldn't be a moral dog dog companion. I see people in my own building. It's a condo building in Chicago and they hire dog walkers. And these dog walkers walk three or four people's dogs twice a day. So they get two walks a day all on leashes and all with other people's dogs. That's not a good life for a dog. And the other thing is the dogs often, they need to run off leash. The cities don't really yet accommodate that very well. There are only two dog parks in my general region and they're very small. So again, even if I was there all the time, I would have a hard time giving a dog a kind of life that I think a dog needs. But it's not just that it is being there, being there for the dog, with the dog. If you have a very demanding job and you're out most of the day, I think you aren't a very good companion. It's very similar to the decision to have a child. You really have to think it's a very large decision and it will change your life. But most people think, oh no, it won't change my life. It'll just give me some fun or something. That's what the word pet suggests. And I don't like that word for that reason. But during COVID, of course, people were lonely. So they did adopt dogs. And then when they went back to work, they thought, oh, I don't have time for that. And they took the dog back to the shelter. So this is not good. You have to think about your whole life changing to include that other complicated being. And most people just haven't done enough thinking. Mm -hmm. 
And I think one of the ideas that's most exciting in the book, uh, and I want to second the recommendation of Zoopolis, if I can look on Donaldson, Donaldson um, but is sort of the effort you put into thinking about like what um, legal and political status and representation for other animals would look like. So what what models are there out there that would help us think about politically representing a dog? Well, I think the first thing is to think what models we now have for young children and for people with severe cognitive disabilities. Those can be applied, if we were willing to do it, to dogs. So, for example, we have a Department of Child and Family Services in Chicago. And as an employee of a university that does some work with young children on the campus, I am required as a mandatory reporter under law, if I see a child anywhere on the campus who looks like cold or out there with not enough warm clothing on and so on, I'm required as a reporter to call the Department of Child and Family Services and report that incident. And, and I, of course, DCFS is not a department that's perfect. It's always being complained about and so on. But at least it's a place to go. And I think there should be a similar system for animals, that we all see animals who are being neglected and abused, but we should all be mandatory reporters and make a call to that animal ministry, if such existed, to say, okay, here's an incident report. And that, I think, would help. Now, of course, it would have to be well run or it wouldn't be any good, but all these things have to be well run. So that's one thing that I would like to see. I would like to see a lot more attention to layout of cities where dogs are concerned, a lot more dog parks. Cats, I think, are more adaptable, and most people I know choose to keep cats indoors. And that seems to me a perfectly ethical choice if the cat is given enough attention and enough diversion and stimulation and so forth. But dogs need the out of doors and they need to run freely and so forth. So we need to redesign our cities and create a lot more spaces for dogs. I think restaurants are already getting in line. They're allowing dogs to come with their companions. Hotels are getting in line. But still, dogs have to be on leashes. And that's not, that's okay part of the time but it's not okay for a lot of the time. Dogs need to run. So I think a lot of redesigning, I agree with Donaldson and Kimlicka. I had a dog when I was a little girl and we had a yard and we had this big backyard that was fenced in to protect the dog and the dog could be just easily let out into the nice backyard. But most people don't have that. Certainly in cities, they don't have that. And so that means the city has to take thought for the dogs that are there. And so these are the things that would be part of making dogs real citizens of the city, letting their preferences, and it's obvious that dogs prefer space to run around off leash, letting their preferences count when laws are made. And then it also requires legal standing. If there are welfare laws against, let's say, animal abuse, and they're not being enforced, right now, there's very little that anyone who cares can do because animals don't have legal standing. Standing means that you have to have a particularized injury to go to court. Well, if I see a dog being abused, I don't have standing to go to court on behalf of that animal. At most in the legal tradition that's unfolded, I could say, oh, I have an aesthetic injury because I've seen that animal being abused. And that's a weird category, the aesthetic injury. Why? Why couldn't I say I have a, an ethical injury? But anyway, that's the way the law has evolved. And it's not enough. So it has to be the injury to the animal has to be what gets you in the door. And four countries right now give animals legal standing. They can be the plaintiffs of an action. Colombia, Argentina, India, as I've already mentioned, and Ecuador. So they each did it for separate reasons. In the case of Colombia, it was because Pablo Escobar brought a lot of wild animals to Colombia, but then he didn't really make provision for how they would be cared for. And so then the parliament thought there are too many hippos in Colombia, let's shoot them all. And luckily they allowed the hippos standing to be the plaintiffs of a complaint against that cruel vote of parliament. 
and they won. So yeah, legal standing for animals is a big deal. And we already give legal standing to infants who can't talk yet, to people with cognitive disabilities who may not be able to talk lifelong, to people who are, have lost their wits, so to speak, in age and can no longer talk. Those can all enter the courtroom. So it doesn't mean you have to go there and speak. You have a guardian and the guardian hires a lawyer and then you go to court, but you are the plaintiff and your concerns can be the, the occasion of a legal judgment. And that's what we really need. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you mentioned hippos. Um, I think um, wild animals are another aspect of this. And you know, many animal advocates, environmentalists, and others would argue we should essentially be trying to leave wild animals alone. You know, Stop killing them, stop destroying so much of their habitat, but also try not to intervene in their lives too much either way, either because it's none of our business or because you know, they're worried ecosystems are complicated, so we don't know what effect those interventions will have or out of you know respect for the autonomy of wild animals, they don't want to interfere. But you don't necessarily find um, any of this altogether convincing. So what sorts of interventions do you think we should be making? First of all, I think there's no possibility of just leaving animals alone. That might have been one time in human history that might have been a possible course of action, but we're not there. We're in a situation where every space on the earth, in the seas, and in the skies is controlled by human beings. We are the owners, really, and the controllers. We can't back off of that, and uh, there's no sign that we would be willing to do that anyway. And so land, well, even the largest places where wild animals are allegedly wild are nature reserves in the larger African countries. And they're managed by the nation and managed often very well. The nation takes action to prevent poachers from coming in there. I've seen a whole lot of military on the border of a nature reserve in Botswana because they want to prevent the poachers from coming in from Namibia. Anyway, so they have to keep poachers out. They have to spray for tsetse flies and prevent other pestilential plagues on animals. And those, that's a kind of beneficent custody, but most of the world is not, not so benignly owned by humans. They pollute the seas by plastic trash, as I mentioned. But then if you go further out into the sea, you get the oil companies drilling for oil. And they not only make a terrible racket with their drilling, which obstructs the psychology of whales and dolphins who navigate by hearing, but it, they also, before they even drill, they send down air bombs. It's often one every 30 seconds, this loud explosion of air because what they need to do is find out how deep it is and make a map of the ocean floor. So anyway, the life of whales, the stress level of the hormones in the whale is known to have gone way, way up since these practices were introduced. So there's nowhere they can go that's not dominated by humans. So the skies are also dominated by humans. Pollution that kills migratory birds is the same pollution that kills human beings. And migratory birds also are doing a lot of crashing into skyscrapers. People's Christmas lights are a big source of migratory bird death. So there are all these things that make me think there is no wild anymore. They, they have no place to go. So what we must do is to try to be responsible custodians, rather like the people in Botswana who run the nature reserve, but not, not hostile to the animals. And we, we are not doing that so far. Now, as far as intervening goes, I think we all know that keeping the habitat livable requires a lot of intervention. It requires, first of all, preventing humans from doing bad things to the tracts of land out there, which they will do if you let them own it and let's say grow crops on it. Wild horses are already being squeezed out by the grazing lands of ranchers in Wyoming. But then second, you do need to try to make it as healthy an environment as possible, keeping out people who are hostile, the poachers, but also keeping out endemic diseases so that tsetse flies, for example. And then you might think, should we go a little further? If I see, if a let's say somebody managing the wildlife reserve in Kenya sees a tiger with a broken limb, 
Sometimes now they know enough. They know how to take that tiger from its own group, set the limb and restore it to its own group. And that should always be the goal. Obviously adopting every wounded animal would be a terrible policy, but to restore it to its own way of life is what the capabilities approach would dictate. But you might intervene in the meantime, as we, we certainly would if it was a companion animal, and we probably would even if it was a coyote wandering around in our cities. So why not set the tiger's limb? Then, though, we get to this terribly difficult question of what animals do to each other. That is a terribly difficult question. And I think we should treat it as a difficult question, not just say, oh, that's how nature is and so forth. Because we're not dealing with so-called nature anymore. We're dealing with a world that's made and controlled by humans. So the only question is then, what about predation? If we have a cat in our home, that cat usually is not given little birds to eat. If the cat goes outdoors, most companions of cats try to discourage the cat from chasing a little bird. And instead, they don't want the cat to be frustrated, so they give the cat a substitute behavior, scratching a post, playing with a ball, all these things. And I think domestic cats have learned that they can live rewarding, non-frustrated lives in this way. What about in the wild? Well, we know that zoos do the same thing. That is, if a tiger is in a zoo, they give it a weighted ball to play with, and then they, they give it humanely killed meat to eat. And of course, increasingly, I hope that both our domestic cats and the wild cats could eat meat grown from stem cells without the actual killing of an animal. That is a really important discovery, and it will soon be on the market. But anyway, I don't think that tigers should be kept in zoos. So it wouldn't be a solution to the problem to round all, up all the tigers and put them all in zoos. So what do we do when they're in the wild? I think we don't know enough to do any intervention at all, but we should recognize that the problem of what happens to the little antelope who gets eaten is a problem. It's a horrible life. And of course the antelope evolved not to be a prey, it evolved to survive. Only those animals have survived if they have a genuine capacity for survival and for living their own life. So what do we do about the fact that these prey animals don't get to live their own life? Well, I think we can intervene only at the margins. And one margin that I point to in the book, there's a whole industry in the animal tourist industry, which I call Sado tourism, which is catering to the desires of foreign people who come to an African country in order to see predation because they can't see it at home and they don't allow their own domestic cat even to kill a little bird. They want to see animals killing. It's like the Romans who went to the gladiatorial games. And that was terrible because people took great pleasure, not only in seeing animals killed in the gladiatorial games, but of course seeing humans killed as well if they were unpopular humans. And the people that I had been on safari with are not very different from those Romans, I'm afraid. In my Jeep one day, going out at 4 a.m., where we were going to be treated to a feast of seeing a pack of wild dogs jump on the back of a little antelope and tear it limb from limb before it was even dead. So in the Jeep were six people. It was me. Uh, then there was a bird watcher who really loved to look at the birds and note them. Four other people who had come to Botswana explicitly to see this kind of carnage. And they knew it. They knew that their money comes from that, that spectacle. So they had arranged for, they propped up artificially the population of the wild dogs to make sure there are enough wild dogs that every day there would be a spectacle of carnage that people could watch. So it's all quite artificial. I think in the absence of that, there would be far fewer wild dogs. They might even become extinct. And in my view, what is really important is the lives of individual creatures. The species as such is only of instrumental importance. So I might or might not be very grieved if those wild dogs became extinct. But in any case, they're there in the numbers that they are because the government of Botswana and its tourist industry want people to come in there to see 
carnage. And that is what I call Sado tourism. It was very striking because I think most of humanity has learned not to take delight in the spectacle of carnage. We don't go out and spectate wars anymore. We feel if we even we think a war is a just war, we don't go and watch it with glee. And we don't want to really take pleasure in the blood that's shed. But these people were really taking pleasure in animal blood. And I thought it was connected to their attitude to humans as well, because these were South African farmers, very rich. And they talked as we drove along in our Jeep. They talked about their black employees and how they were infected by HIV AIDS. And they said, oh, they breed like animals. So, you know, I think one kind of hate and prejudice leads into another. And the people that we want in our world are people who do not want to see carnage because those very same people are likely to be insensitive to all other kinds of carnage. So so anyway, I think we should stop Sado tourism. Well, yeah, I think that's a good place to end, uh, you know, a powerful evidence for the need for a multi-species international justice. And is there anything you want to add, Martha? Well, I just want to say, you know, I, the book has a lot of different parts. It has parts about each of the bad theories. It has a long section on what sentience is and what the evidence is that different kinds of animals have it and why I think sentience is a good boundary line and that therefore plants and most insects fall on the other side of that line. So these are things that people may disagree with, but I hope they find the arguments interesting. And then there are there's a chapter about the harm of death that I've mentioned, a chapter about tragic conflicts that I've mentioned, a chapter on domestic animals, a chapter on wild animals, and then finally the chapter on law. So, so there's a lot there that a lot of people will disagree with, but I hope some of it you'll be persuaded by. And I'd love it if you took a look at the book. You forgot a chapter on friendship that I... Oh, yes, yes, that came in later. It's interesting because it wasn't in the original plan. But then Rachel and I, it was Rachel's last article. We wrote a co-authored article about friendships between humans and other animals. And I said to my editor, you know, here's this article. And I think this is an important issue. Can I add it to the book? He said he liked it. But then if I cut out so and so many words from other chapters, I could let it in. <laughs> so, yes, I talk about friendships, of course, between human beings and companion animals. But I also think under suitable circumstances, there can be genuine friendships between human beings and wild animals. So I do talk about that. And I, I think it would be good if we had that attitude, at least as a possibility if, when we approach animals. There's a, a lot there in the book, Justice for Animals, Our Collective Responsibility by Nartha Nussbaum. Um, Martha, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Dayton. I really appreciate it. It's a great show. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, again, the book is Justice for Animals, Our Collective Responsibility. There's a lot of good stuff there. Again, you can agree or disagree, but um, I think overall it's a really exciting contribution in the realm of animal ethics and political thought. And I am excited to uh, you know discuss with others and curious what you would think if you read it, listener. Okay, that's all for now. Um, I should have another episode for you in mid to late January, so keep your eyes open. Sign up for the newsletter if that is how you like to keep up with podcasts. Subscribe on your preferred podcast listening app. Support on Patreon. Follow me on social media. There are simply so many ways to keep up with storytelling animals. Isn't that fun? All right, hope you have a great day. Happy New Year. Hope you have a great year. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah!